I remember exactly what brought me into the field of architecture. In fact, I have a, uh, a, a clear memory of it. Uh, it's almost like yesterday, uh, although it's a long time ago. So when I was young, I was traveling a lot around Europe with my parents in uh, Germany. And um, one was doing my O-levels uh, at the secondary modern school in England, uh, Charters Secondary Modern, and we had an arts uh, teacher, Mr. Duffy, and he said, um, uh, now you, you really don't know how to speak English, uh, you know, you haven't been here for only uh, some few months, I'll, I'll put you to some work, uh, I'll let you work in the art class you can do whatever you want. You can spend more time here. You, you, you can sort of uh, use all the equipment that we have in the room. Uh, you can, yeah, since you don't know language, feel free to come to the art class, basically. Uh, and it took about half a year and then we had a longer discussion on where does art go? You know, it was the time when you were doing scraper boards, uh, white, black, colored, you know, doing some prints. Uh, I was 15. And then uh, at the end of that year, uh, I made up my mind that architecture is probably something in this combination. I always like to build things in a funny way, uh, like small cabins when I was six, seven, eight, you know, with wood and uh, making things happen. Or it could be objects, uh, it could be models. Um, no, I, I'm not a Lego kid, you know, I, I never came from, from that side or like Meccano. I didn't come from that side, many do, but uh, I came in from the side of wanting to express something or um, sort of create a, a picture of something that might become. So in that sense, Mr. Duffy told me, okay, we agreed you should become an architect, secondary modern school in England, uh, age of 16. So I, I had this notion of trying to do architecture, it was really no clue what it was about, right? You don't know uh, what it is, but you have some sort of hope or vision. That, you know, it might be something that could help others, you, you know, uh, be something that could help society in a way. I was politically very far left at, at that time. Um, yeah, communist, basically. Uh, so you go in and you, you start operating within this idea of architecture as a tool within different parts of society. It was creative, something you could do, make something out of. So then I started applying for different uh, architectural schools at the end of that third year. And I couldn't get in anywhere. I think, you know, uh, growing up in a, in a Nordic country, uh, we have a special terminology, slöjd, which is handcrafting uh, with all kinds of stuff, but mainly wood, actually. At least for the men uh, uh, at the time when I grew up, uh, the women had slightly different slöjd. But um, I think this notion that uh, it was obligatory to actually work in the workshops uh, a day almost a day a week, in fact, from the uh, age of 12. Uh, gave us the understanding of how to use the different tools, uh, the understanding of what it is. And my, in my opinion, architecture is really not about uh, only the head or the stomach. I, I think actually the whole body is active when you create ar architecture. And that's why this mix between a really touching material, being able to create something out of it, it could be clay. Uh, clay is fantastic, in fact. I'm working with clay and I have a story in Graz about that afterwards. But this notion of understanding the materials, holding them in your hand, uh, holding the tools that you know can actually change the appearance of a material and see what it does, how sharp is sharp, you know, uh, how really sharp is a knife when it's sharp, what is the difference between a sharp knife and a not sharp knife, they all look the same, but you know, so understanding these millimeter things uh, or less than a millimeter things to understand how do you maintain a tool, you know, how do you generate the expression you want, how do you move forward, and I think these things all together sort of uh, create a notion of more contact with yourself. I have to be quite honest, I, I love the computer too, of course, because it does things that you couldn't do otherwise. I mean, everything from parametric and all the way you sort of program and, uh, yeah. But there's something in combination here, 
which I believe is the reason why we have a body, you could say. <laughs> I mean, we have to use it for something. Otherwise, I, I could just put my brain into a glass of uh, I don't know what and, and just use the brain. But it's, there's something about movement, activity, using your body. Uh, and I think that's why we learn to walk on two feet. Uh, I mean, simply to have the arms free to create. You know, so you actually move this kind of notion of, of creativity from through your body and up, so you can actually yeah, you can actually hold the tool in your hands. So there is a there is a long evolution, of course, based that leads us into believing that uh, inventions, um, creativity, is connected to the fact that the brain has evolved. The brain has then given us the possibility of, of fantasy. Uh, creativity and by that releasing other body parts to actually hold things not to go back only to the touch system or the mouse system so that's why I'm, I'm really defending very strongly the workshop mythology that you do it can usually be with a lot of wonderful tools digital tools like 3d printing or but there's to be something between the hands and at some point it's easier to turn this thing around than this thing around. It's a different experience. You need both. I was actually sitting at the board of the university in Oslo for many, many years. And this kind of notion of study points, for instance, in order for the professor to be able to get his money back for his uh, part of the studies, uh, the amount of students, is all kind of a pressure in direction of, as you say, mathematics, money, um, uh, objective truths, they call it, you know, because if you don't have 16 diploma students, uh, okay, you don't qualify for the money to your uh, sort of institute. And all these things are happening in a sequence. So, yes. There is a huge down prioritizing of cultural, creative uh, sports. And the corona strengthened that notion. The corona said, okay, all these things that we do together basically have to fall out. So now you can only communicate on Teams, on Zoom, you know, you can only sit uh, with yourself. And the part that it's generated is that the uh, loneliness aspect in the cities has increased massively in a certain age, around early 20s especially, those that are studying study. And all of these things come together simply because the priorities already were downgraded. I, I don't want to sound, cons you know, it's not a conspiracy, but, but in a way you can feel that society is moving in a direction where there is more value to the things that actually creates an income that pays taxes in a way and to the others that try to find a way in life that makes meaning or actually has a content. And if you look at these two things together, there's a clear tendency in uh, what direction it's going. And I think it's true that this is happening I mean, in Austria, but it's happening all over. This is a tendency. And uh, I think culture has been, uh, the, the cultural ministries around the world, or especially in Europe maybe, they, you know, they're losing money every year. It's going like tick, tick, tick. Education, money down every year. Bap, bap, bap. Research, down, money, bap, bap, bap. all the way. And all of a sudden you end up with nada. You know, I think it's a, a difficulty. And we're, we all, who think different, have to fight against this. I think in uh, our way of uh, sort of standing up against some of these issues is continuously to promote that uh, being physical is part of the solution. So there are lots of options. You have sports, you have other types of crea uh, creativities, but using your body as part of the overall tool starts becoming really crucial. So when it could be performing arts, it could be uh, playing an instrument, it could be just writing by hand, it could be a lot of uh, different things. But in that sense, in our own company, Internet, we're trying to promote sort of this balanced uh, approach to things and saying, okay, if you come and have been educated at the AA, or if you've been educated in Innsbruck, or you've been educated in South Africa, what happens when these people come together and start discussing these issues inside a smaller community, let's say 20 people around the table, discussing exactly what does this mean to me. And by doing that, you create 
young and fairly strong ambassadors. You know that they are going to go back into the schools, they are teaching, they are uh, spreading the word. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Sounds a little bit religious, but, but I mean, uh, really taking uh, part in this way of thinking. And I think in the end, it's, it's about slow but steady, uh, repeating the things that we believe Mm, that we believe in uh, and sort of portray the importance of it through results. That's why we do the post-occupancy studies of our projects basically to show okay architecture is also a tool. Yes, it can be beautiful, it can be ugly, uh, it can do this, that. How do you measure that? How do you actually use that as an argument in front of a politician, in front of a, uh, a realist? You know, how, how do, do these things come together and uh, part of the post-occupancy studies that we do is to show it has an effect. It changed from here to there. And when you can point down and use, you know, if, if you want to sell a project, put on a tie. Uh, if the guy is on the other side, I don't care. I'll put on anything, you know, I'll put on a clown suit if, 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 if I can get my things across. Because I really do believe that a lot of the things that we do are not necessarily necessarily being valued as important because they're not measured in the way a realist wants it to be measured. So then we move into the realists' uh, realm and argue the same way they do. And then we can defend the creativity backing this result. And I think that's what we keep doing. That's why that's what we do in the different studios. In, in, in Innsbruck, they have a fantastic little workshop, which runs quite smoothly. But in Adelaide, we have a huge workshop, wood workshop, under the office, which we use for producing one-to-one -one furniture, bespoke furniture, one-to-one one -one pieces, uh, prototyping. In Oslo, we have all these kind of workshop elements for prototyping and so forth. So I think for us, it's a matter of staying stable and true to what we believe in the sequence of things and then uh, just try to stick to that and you know all of a sudden uh, right now you're maybe at the bottom of the curve but you know maybe slowly a little bit further up and maybe a little bit down again so it, n nothing is stable but yeah just uh, keep promoting what you think is right Now you're on to something here which is, uh, in my mind, extremely interesting. Uh, it's, uh, it's the big dilemma right, of everything. Uh, uh, bicycle path or trees? Do you cut trees in order to create a bicycle path? Or do you put windmills into nature to create CO2-free energy uh, and ruin nature uh, by doing that? So it, it's uh, this huge dilemma of things. And we have to be quite honest that nothing is uh, solved very quickly, but you have to have ambitions, right? And that ambition is then sort of directed not only towards your own doing, but also the collective doing of the rest of the world. So you, you cannot, for instance, solve the climate crisis on your own. It's a completely, completely, totally impossible. Even if I segregate all the, 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 the different garbage that I have at home, uh, you know, I, I will not contribute, basically. And it's a huge, huge issue. So that's why also now I see, for instance, the ex Marcello that we're doing, that you have to rely on communities. You have to rely on more than just one building and one building and one building. You have to look at this building is using energy, this building is producing energy, uh, this one is using less, or maybe here, you know, you have a swimming pool over there, it's really, here you have a big flat surface like a, like a sports arena, a sports hall, big roof can produce a lot of solar energy, and you exchange. This one can fill up the buses and the cars with electricity, this one cannot. So it's about communities and looking at things in constellation. And we call those uh, zero emission neighborhoods. And zero emission neighborhoods is a research program that we're doing with the university in Tondheim. And we started off with zero emission buildings, and now it's expanded into zero emission neighborhoods. And the Ex Marcello project is in a way an extension within the uh, EU programs to try to investigate this. So, of course, one of the questions uh, yesterday during the lecture was, is it true, and of course it's true, the most sustainable is to build nothing. Now, of course it's true, but that doesn't help us much, does it? I mean, 
Yes, it, it puts something into a certain perspective of saying, uh, if I did nothing, if I killed myself, that would be the most sustainable, basically. Because I would, there would be one less mouth to feed, there would be one less person in the world. So killing myself would be the most sustainable thing I could do. Uh, truly. But I don't want to, right? And in the same way, I don't want to let the hopes for the future sort of die. Because there are still necessities out there, there are still people who need things, there's still education ongoing, new forms of education, there's new forms of treating uh, hospital patients, get them out of the hospitals, into nature. There are still things we can do in order to enhance, let's say, the, the level of being human. So I don't want to lose this aspect. But I think in the end, the, the, the pushing of a client needs backing. Uh, if we were the only ones in the world saying you have to produce uh, the total aspect of a building, the whole life cycle of the building included, should be negative after 40 years, or at least neutral, CO2 neutral, including all embodied energies, embodied equivalents in CO2, uh, I would say no chance, no chance. So here we're really relying on the world changing position, and we saw actually during COVID, that it is possible. You know, you can actually create a vaccine within three months to basically save the world. And the urgency in the climate crisis hasn't reached the same level. So for now, we want to be as negative as we can in order to create uh, urgency and argue for the sort of uh, enormous deep fall we can take. Because the planet will survive. You know, plants, they will shift from Mediterranean to the North Pole and, you know, they will, you will have Mediterranean fish in the Norwegian fjords and, you know, they, they will survive. But we won't. You know, the humankind will not. And that's, that's the big, sort of, we are then no longer part of nature. And uh, at that particular point in time, we have to look at what are we actually doing? How are we promoting ourselves in this world? by also taking care of it as part of a natural system. And that needs to be pushed towards clients. You can't stop building. That would be unfair to those who don't have. Uh, we cannot stop developing the world, in my mind. But we have to do it the right way. And that, to me, is the, is the biggest question. And by doing that, it's not going to happen overnight. But you need the tools, you need the politicians, you need the people who are fighting uh, this corner to be on your side and you need to be able to show them it has an effect, bang, on the table. And by that, we're changing slowly. Not only the, the sort of approach, but we're slowly changing the attitudes, we're changing the programs, architectural programs. And the EU Commission is actually doing quite a bit of work for the moment where I can see it has an effect into smaller communities, into cities, into local politicians. And they all seem to say, okay, I didn't think of this last year, but this year I am. And that makes a change. Uh, I mean, in, in the context of Europe especially, uh, states uh, are a little bit different, but how do you actually recycle something that you already have? Uh, what is the value of the thing you have? So. The investigations that need to be done, in my mind, is not only the CO2 content, but there is also an emotional content, there is a historical content, social content. So what happens if you have a slaughterhouse like in Milan? What kind of picture do you have in your head when you think about a slaughterhouse? What do you think? You see the pigs being chopped up, you see the cows you know, losing their legs, you, you have the most horrifying pictures in your head, right? So how do you turn this sort of dark history, if you wish. We still eat meat a lot. Norway actually now uh, is eating more red meat than before the corona, per uh, kilo, kilograms per person. So in any case, we have this slaughterhouse and it becomes a new urban community. So how do you counteract? How, how resilient can you actually react upon that given landscape which carries this bloody history in it, into something positive, into something new. And I think I, massive amounts of opportunities uh, when it comes to how to deal with uh, landscapes, uh, ecology, how to deal with uh, the existing building structures. And yes, you're right. I mean, looking at something that you already have at hand, 
It's like looking at the landscape, whether it's constructed by humans or not. It doesn't really matter. It's something you have at hand. It's like topography, almost. And once you start inhabiting this existing topography, whether it's a building or not, all of a sudden you recognize that you have to analyze these things as if they were landscapes, as if they actually did have a specificity in them, which was real, which was true, aged. And that means you have to start looking at design differently when you adapt and use existing elements in new settings. So that's what we're trying to do in, um, in uh, Ex Marcello, which is the name of the project in Milan. Because even there, the old slaughter hall is just a garden. Okay, we let the wall stay, but we don't even bother to put up a roof, right? Because it doesn't make any difference. But the walls are still there and they create a small microclimate inside these walls with the heat radiation coming out. So we know there is a temperature difference inside the walls and outside the walls. So tiny little aspects of how to deal with, uh, let's say, yeah, microclimatic aspects. Uh, the reason of leaving things, you know, just taking them down has a CO2 equivalent. Transporting it away has a CO2 equivalent. So you get rid of all these at least. And then you have the building site action, electrified, and the way we should be dealing with future uh, electricity and how we produce electricity and, and getting into these points. But, and the electricity mix per se in Europe, which is slowly changing also. But apart from that, using existing things is a must. Even if you need what you have or not, just leave it. You know, you can always use it for something. Uh, you don't have to first write the program, then look at the buildings you have, and then tear down whatever doesn't suit the program, and then build the new stuff. No, start by analyzing what you have, then write the program, and then move into redesigning, because then you will find out that a lot more things can be left. Uh, instead of taking them, them down. If you look at how much time I spend in, in following my profession, and I like to call it a profession and not a consultancy. We're not architects and not consultants. We actually produce something, we do something. Well, apart from that, which is, I have to say and be quite honest, you know, occupy most of my hours every day uh, in one way or another. But then you have the arts, quite obviously. But I think uh, as, as maybe the biggest inspiration uh, is still probably coming out of the arts, I would say, because it sort of is more free. And you can get inspired by something that is more free than architecture. But at the same time, I would have to say my biggest inspiration are other people. So I, I'm a people's guy. Uh, you know, I, I really spend most of my time trying to understand, talk, discuss, read, uh, getting in contact with people that actually do contribute to my everyday life. And that's apart from the little skiing I still do or, you know, the boating or fishing or whatever I do when I have a little bit of time. And I love fishing, by the way, and skiing also. But, but you know, people, I, I find worlds are being opened uh, when I talk to people when I meet people. So probably I could just have uh, sort of been happy with talking to people. I don't, I mean, <laughs> there is no such profession, right? You're a psychologist, but, but, but I, I couldn't do that either because it's not about uh, healing. Uh, it's about uh, curiosity, I guess, uh, getting into people's interpretation of things. So I think uh, if, if the question would be, you know, what do you do when you don't do architecture? I do people.